I realize that the phrase Happy New Year always resonates with a certain irony your first day back in school, but welcome back anyway. I had a wonderful vacation, but now the vacation's over and it's back to art history. If you're wondering what great piece of Renaissance art I decided to begin this unit with, this is Michelangelo's grocery list, honest. It was displayed in an exhibit of Michelangelo's papers at the Seattle Art Museum, and here's what the program said about this artifact. I quote, because the servant he was sending to market was illiterate, Michelangelo illustrated the shopping list, a herring, tortelli, two fennel soups, four anchovies, and a small quarter of a rough wine. And here we have the true Renaissance man, interested in everything, including a good meal. I'll just note that if my family had to rely on a Mary McConnell illustrated grocery list to figure out what to buy, we would all starve. So we used to cover the material in this unit in two and a half units. Ouch. The College Board has drastically edited down the list of Renaissance works you're expected to know, but also drops dangerous hints that yes, of course, you should know other major works from this period as well. Sigh. We'll do our best, and that includes refusing to go along with some of the College Board's more shocking deletions, such as the great competition to design the bronze doors of the Florence Cathedral Baptistry, the engineering marvel of Brunelleschi's dome over Florence Cathedral, the oil paintings of Leonardo da Vinci, the sculptures of Michelangelo, among other works. While well, this unit will take us back to the 14th century and north to Flanders, the Netherlands, and Germany, for today we're going to stay put in one city and one time, Florence, Italy, during the first half of the 15th century. So consider today's fare a tasting menu. Tonight and tomorrow you'll settle down to the main course and the serious work will begin. Most modern histories of Europe begin here, in this city at the dawn of the 15th century. The question I want you to begin thinking about today is why? What was it about Florence that spawned and also attracted so many great artists? What was it about this moment in history that produced both a classical revival and a burst of innovation? I hope and really trust that you will not succumb to the simplistic judgment of Renaissance Italians themselves. They thought that they had reclaimed civilization from the barbarians, or as they dubbed them, the Goths, hence the Gothic Age. This is not the art of a primitive culture. But even though we're all much too awed by cathedrals and stained glass to label the entire Middle Ages as barbaric, we still need to understand that something did happen in Florence, and further that this something did represent a major shift in human history and with it the history of art. For the remainder of this class, you're going to look at three somewhat different video interpretations of the origins of the Renaissance. If you don't have time to finish the last set of clips, by the way, I hope you'll finish watching at home. I have never seen a history of Italian Renaissance art, Renaissance art that didn't emphasize the path-breaking expressionism and linear perspective of Masaccio, the famous competition for the honor and future fame of designing the doors of the Florence Cathedral Baptistry, or the classical rediscovery and scientific innovation of Brunelleschi's magnificent dome, shown here. So we're going to thumb our noses at the list and start here anyway. Still, as you watch these videos, I want you to stay focused on my initial question. Why did art history shift decisively in Florence, Italy at the dawn of the 15th century? Let's begin with my favorite art historian, Sister Wendy Beckett, as she takes us to Florence. Again, note that Sister Wendy puts a lot of emphasis on two artists that the College Board left out, Masaccio and Fra Angelico. As you probably gathered, I'm on Sister Wendy's side here. I'm assuming that after watching this video clip, you stopped to talk about the questions I put on the previous slide. So now let me ask a couple more. What misperception about the meaning of Renaissance humanism is Sister Wendy trying to head off? The Renaissance was not a rebellion against religion. There are few more religious ages, and much of the art we will view is clearly religious in its subject matter and motivation. Nevertheless, as Sister Wendy asserts, the Renaissance did elevate the importance of the human creation, 
of human dignity, of human potential, and of the value of the talented individual artist. One very important change that occurs in this period is that artists begin to regularly sign their works. During the Middle Ages, often artists who were considered more as craftsmen than as artists really uh, did not sign, and so we assign them names such as the master of some town or another where a painting was found. In the Renaissance, we know the names of the artists. This video clip ended with a mention of the great patron family, the Medici. But Sister Wendy does not tackle a very important question, which is why did Florence's merchant culture give rise to such a vast expansion in patronage? And why did these patrons seek out and foster individual geniuses, such as Masaccio, Fra Angelico, Brunelleschi, and Michelangelo? So let's turn to a second video to begin exploring this question. The next video clip, by the way, begins with a glimpse of a fresco by Giotto, who is a transitional figure between medieval and Renaissance art, and we're going to be talking about Giotto in some length in our next class. These frescoes of the life of St. Francis can still be seen in the Franciscan Church of Santa Croce in Florence. Definitely put it on your list. Along with the tomb of the great Renaissance humanist and historian Leonardo Bruni. So, let's hear the tale of what may be art history's most famous contest. Economic historians sometimes describe this period, and especially the later Renaissance, as the commercial revolution. Money reappeared on a large scale, replacing an economy based mostly on barter or direct exchange of goods. Merchants like the Medici founded banks, and these banks in turn financed further economic expansion. Trade grew, grew dramatically, first within the Mediterranean and North Sea trading areas, and then with new developments developments in navigation, trade extended to the Far East and the New World, vastly increasing cultural exchange. So, what does it say about a society that would hold a competition to award two extremely important commissions, the Baptistry Doors, which you've just heard about, and the Dome over Florence Cathedral, which you'll see in a minute? Maybe it's my training in economics, which is another online course I've inflicted on Juan Diego students. But I think that along with the rediscovery of ancient texts, the rise of a merchant class that lived and breathed competition was an extraordinarily important impetus for humanism and for art. There was some social mobility during the Middle Ages, but for the most part, people were expected, and they expected themselves, to stay put in the social class to which they were born. The ruling elite was a noble class that guarded entry into its ranks pretty closely. And almost everyone, peasants, priests, nobles, viewed the upstart town dwellers with suspicion. Except, that is, in the Italian city-states, or more accurately, some of the Italian city-states, where the merchant class seized political power and began reshaping culture in its own image. Enter the Medici. There is no single explanation for the Renaissance and no single individual who can claim responsibility. But we are going to, if we are going to focus on individuals, I recommend that we start with two upstarts who together transformed the world of art. Cosimo de' Medici, the great patron, and Filippo Brunelleschi, artist, sculptor, uh, and architect. I doubt you'll have time, but the story continues with two artists we will encounter later in the third day of this unit. Filippo Lippi and Donatello.